going to start with a quote <laughs> by Richard Wiseman. All right. Lucky people create, notice, and act upon the chance opportunities in their lives. Being in the right place at the right time is actually all about being in the right state of mind. Oh, that's terrific. (laughs) I love that. Yes. What what does that quote bring up for you? Well, two things. One is the word luck. Um, I say to people it's actually an acronym. It's L-U-C-K, and it's called Laboring Under Correct Knowledge. Ooh, I love that. Which is why some people have a lot more of it than others. <laughs> Which is, and what really that quote says, if you're paying attention, then it's much more likely that obviously um, you're going to discover things and see opportunities than if you're caught up in your own internal stuff. Um, you know, it's like somebody who is unaware of what they're seeing when they're driving because most of our driving is mechanical. But you need a certain amount of fresh awareness so that the unexpected, you know, the little old lady who who decides it's a time to run across the street um, against the light, uh, you notice her. Right. And in in a sense, luck is, um, it's it's like opportunities are everywhere. And most of the time, two things. One is we don't see them in the first place, and two, they're not for us. And so that quote is saying, if you're paying, you know, if you're, if your eyes are open, you are much more likely to see things. Right. And how much of success is reliant on being in the right self state at the right time? Right. Well, yes. And, and there's a, 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 a NPR program called How They Built This. It's great. great and it's podcast. a wonderful program about all kinds of interesting things. And then you find out how did it start? And it started always usually humbly and desperately and foolishly. And there were gross mistakes made. Um, but people were paying attention to the possibilities. And that the what what the difference is, someone who says, I really know what I'm doing, and this is the right way to do it, and it's always worked this way they're in trouble because they're not able to change self-states or awareness states uh, at the right time. Right. It's like in the, in the stock market, buying is easy. Selling is hard because buying, you're already figured out that this is something which, for various reasons, is likely to do better in the short or long run. And that's usually factual. Selling is, is it going to go higher? Am I going to miss? Because I'm only in this because I want it to go up. But it, it's, it, now it's up. And it also goes down. And all of those suddenly are indeterminate. And they take a very different mindset than buying. And I can speak very personally to that because I'm terrible at selling. And I have learned not to get into a situation in which selling is the way out. So it's I don't have a self that knows how to do that. Hmm. And I finally at least have a self that knows that I don't have one to do that. Right, right, right. It's kind of like, you know, I'm going to make something at home, a particular food, and I have to think at a distance because I'm now in a market, what do I have on my shelves? Now, am I the kind of person who knows that or not? And that makes a big difference. So what we're looking at indeed is, um, are you in the right mind at the right time? And are you able to notice that that's that's kind of two levels and we'll look at both of those because if you don't know what i'm talking about i just lost you right (laughs) well i i think that um everyone knows what you're talking about if they ask themselves that great question that you have in your book have you ever had an argument with yourself right so we're talking about what i'm talking about in a book called your symphony of selves and It's about improving your inner harmony so that not only your life works better, but you're nicer to yourself and to other people. And it comes out of the recognition that as much as we wish other people were consistent, they're not. And the next thing is you notice is you happen to be other people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And that people say to you, how could you have done that? And the, and the answer usually, if you're not paying attention to yourself, is I don't know. 
I don't know what got into me. That's pretty silly if you think about it. Um, that's like saying, I've indigestion. I don't know what I ate. Okay? Yes, you do. <laughs> you just weren't paying attention. Yeah. So, so this, this early question of, have, you know, when people say, well, there's only one self. How do you know that? Well, there is. Okay. Okay. So because I was brought up that way and my church told me it was like that and psychology said it's like that, who are you to say it's not like that? And I said, well, have you ever argued with yourself? And they say, of course. And they say, well, who is the other person? And then there's that little quiet moment. Because that's a, that's a hard question if there's only one self. It's a very easy question if you allow the personal multiplicity that seems to be obvious. Um, and that's where the book starts and that's where we go. But it takes a while before we do a little history and it turns out that early psychology was totally comfortable and understood selves. In fact, there was only one argument in psychology, which is the clinicians said, of course there are selves, and we see it in people with mental illness. We call it disassociation, which is their selves are not cooperating. But normal people don't have that. <clears throat> the other group who were seeing normal people <laughs> Uh, philosophers and professors and um, just citizens said, of, of course, there are selves. And like people in mental institutions, <coughs> they, we see it in other people and in ourselves. And so that was the only argument. And then something happened in psychology um, that's not of great interest to us today, but a major figure, Freud, kind of changed his theory and when he changed his theory, he, he dropped selves. And everyone kind of went along with that. Hmm. So we're, we're at one hand written this incredibly radical book that everybody else is wrong, um, which never gets you very far. Um, and we've written this incredible book that says everybody has been right up to the last few years and we're just putting it back into, into play. Right. So that's a very different kind of argument. And then the book has maybe a thousand examples, literally. Right. Because if we are multiple selves, it should be visible everywhere. Right. And it is. The, the, the radical idea you know, that uh, we are multiple selves that was around prior and then disappeared more recently it kind of goes in line with a lot of the radical ideas that were just common knowledge for tens of thousands of years. Like, Hey, we should be living in egalitarian communities. Right. You know, <laughs> hunter gatherers did this for a long time. And now we, uh, talk about that idea as kind of radical. Oh, you want to live in, uh, more of a, uh, community space. Like what, what are you talking about? That just seems crazy. Yeah. We forget how recent, something like a bedroom right. is. And rather than God created Adam and Eve and said, when you leave the garden, there's a three-bedroom, two-bath house that you have to live in. Um, yeah, we're, the, the rediscovery of what works naturally, um, curiously, is, is, is always seen as regressive rather than a return to sanity. Yeah, um, I think that your book has really profound implications for compassion. One of the biggest um, problems that I see with many of the many of the ways that we're doing things today, from from isolation to current understanding of psychology, you know, if you're if you're sad, just take this pill and we'll <laughs> we'll make it better, um, is that it, it can make people feel like there's something very wrong with them for not feeling well acclimated to modernity. Right. Um, and I said that I, I felt like your book had the same implications for compassion as sex at dawn had on shame. And to me, that was the, the, the real gift of your book because so often we are really hard on ourselves. Yeah, that's the, that's the fascinating thing is um, even even this notion, it's all built into English. We're hard on ourselves. 
Okay. Now, what you just said was we have selves and that some of the selves, <laughs> right, disapprove that. of the other selves. Yeah. Okay. I love that. So, so the language has, yeah. has, has it all back in there. Yeah. And it is true. We say, I did this <laughs> thing so and good. I don't forgive myself. Now, yeah. who's talking to who? Right. And, the, and a way of making it easier on yourself is to imagine the way you treat your children. See, one of your children does something really bad, okay? Um, you don't throw the child out. <laughs> you don't kill it, <laughs> right? You don't torture it. You don't shame it. You say, what, what went wrong in the way we're living as a family that you did that? And can we work this out so it doesn't happen again? Okay? Now, if you take that now back inside to, and there are systems called inner families, which is another way of talking about selves. And then the question is, is the inner family um, handling themselves well? You know, a lot of families have a, a, like a, a meeting, you know, once a week or once a month, and they just go over stuff um, because they need to communicate as well as possible. Out of that comes compassion. Because if you know that a part of yourself did something terrible and you wonder why, and you, what you're saying is, gee, if it was my child, I would look at the problem. Oh, I can see why my child has been punching her sister, her little sister, because he's being bullied at school. Has nothing to do with a sister. And it has much, not much, in a sense, to do with him. He's under a kind of stress. What can we do to help? Well, if it's all inside yourself, if you say to yourself, you know, what I've been doing at my business is bullying people. And they don't like it. And I don't like it in myself. Let's see if we can find that self that's, that needs to be bullying in order to feel adequate. And then you begin to have compassion. Mm. So you end up, the first person you end up having compassion for when you understand your, that you have selves is yourself. You know, is the, it, and that's great. Um, you, f you don't forgive yourself. You begin to understand and help yourself. Okay. And it's not a solitary act because you're not just having, com by, by learning to have more compassion for yourself, you attain a greater, um, you build a greater muscle for having compassion for other people. Well, that's the, see, that's the fun part. Right. <laughs> Which is then you look at your most significant other. Yeah. And you think, God, you know, she or he is wonderful most of the time. Yeah. But, you know, when... When I see her with her father, it's awful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I say to her afterwards, that was awful. And she says, I know whenever I'm with him, I'm such a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so what she's saying is part of me doesn't know and doesn't have a way out of that problem. And you begin then to have compassion for her rather than thinking, oh, She's such a bitch with her father. Maybe she's just a total bitch, and with me, I've been missing it. Right. And we all have a relative. We all have a relative who we know we don't want to push in a certain direction. Like, Uncle Abner is going to be with us at Thanksgiving. Don't discuss Vaccine. religion. <laughs> Vaccine or religion or, or dog shows or <laughs> Ethiopia, whatever it is. Yeah. Because what happens is then poor Uncle Abner switches, flips, is triggered into a self that is going to come on and ruin everybody's dinner, including his own. Right. And so what we learn is we, if we can't help someone, we can help them by, by, by trying not to do the thing that upsets them. How much of our own, let's say, uh, Uncle Abner does something that makes you go crazy. Yep. Or you see a quality in someone that just, you just cannot handle. How much of that do you think, that emotion is, a, is the result of you not being able to handle that part of yourself? Well, probably like no more than 90%. <laughs> <laughs> and what comes to mind is a memory. I took something called EST, E-S-T, many years ago. It was a very rough and ready self-help program. And I had some after classes. And I was in one that I thought about, about family. And it 
and it asked me to write down what was what did my children do that was you know that was out of line that I didn't approve of or didn't appreciate. And I had young enough children, so there wasn't a very long list. But I remember very writing this list down about my daughter. And then I'm not sure whether they asked me or it just came to me. I then looked at the ones that bothered me. Okay, like all her faults didn't have the same power, the same yeah. valence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so not all, were, not all far, faults are created equally. <laughs> right, and so I had a couple of little stars there for ones where they really set me off. And and the the question was, weren't they weren't worse or better? Then I had the very embarrassing question of asking, what of, of these faults are in me? Surprise. <laughs> All the ones that really bothered me in her were in me. So what really was going on is she would do something and it would trigger my own discomfort in myself, but I wasn't going to look at that. I was going to take it out on my daughter. Uh, let us say things at home improved and she never knew why. Hmm. So that what we're looking at is... Okay, you have selves, and the question is, how do you move between them, voluntarily or involuntarily? Involuntarily, we have the term triggered. Voluntarily is, okay, I'm getting ready for a job interview. I'm going to make my, I'm going to be as calm and as professional and as sensible as possible. I'm also not going to have drunk for the last 24 hours, and I'm going to make sure I got a good night's sleep. So I'm setting myself up for my professional self to go in to have the interview. Makes common sense. And, it, and it's a very realistic thing to do. But it also suggests that I know there's some other selves that would really screw up the interview. That okay? is so good. So that... <laughs> And the question also we, we know very, very strongly, um, in fact, we get confused about it, is how do you behave on a first date? Okay, And a, a term that's gone out of fashion, it used to be a term called a snow job. And a snow job is you went on a date and you came on as someone who you were sure she would like. And it was usually someone nicer than you, more interesting <laughs> than you, more successful than you, and generally a better person. Yeah. Okay. And I was a counselor at uh, Stanford for a while, and, and this was an era, uh, this is when people were dating. And what I said to, I remember the first time I said, I said to someone, you know, you're good at this, but here's the terrible part of it, is she ends up at the end of the evening liking the false person you've created. And at some point, either she only dates the false person and you don't get anything out of it, or she eventually finds out that you're not that and drops you. So the terrible part of doing the snow job is success. And then you start to look at what that is about is the, the, un, the, the unconfident self is the one that goes on dates. Right. And the other one that I recall, now that I'm thinking about dating, um, I remember a young man saying to me, I have a date next weekend. Ah! excitement, um, et cetera. And I said, how's it going to go? He said, it's going to be terrible. It's always terrible when I do dates. I said, well, why don't you skip it? He said, skip it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how hard it is to get a date. I said, no, but you've already told me you're going to screw it up. It's going to be terrible. Why would you do that to yourself? Now, I didn't have these tools at the time to understand that his low self-concept was what he took on dates. And of course they went badly because he was setting it up so that his worst self, you know, or the one least likely to have a successful date was the one who did the dating. Right. So you eventually learn when you're, quote, people, we started with looking at success and luck. Success is when you are appropriately in the correct self. It's not, uh, it's not quote, the, there's a lot of things out there about being your best self and your highest self, um, but that's like ignoring context which is you need a different self if you're, um, if you're trying to close a business deal than you're, you're with your daughter on a merry-go-round. There's no best. There's, a, there's the, 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 most, the, the best fit for each one. And that's what we try and learn. And it makes it, it it's easy, or a lot easier, um, once you realize there are different selves. 
it's much harder to squeeze that one false version of a single self into um, into a box. It's, it's like trying to put 12 puppies into a puppy box. Right. Um, I, uh, when I'm surfing bigger waves yep. that are going to be dangerous, I will do a lot of visualization prior. Mm -hmm. And what this conversation is bringing up for me is I'm actually practicing inhabiting the self state that I want to be in, yep. in that situation. And I'm f fascinated also with stoicism and the practice of negative visualization. Um, when things go terribly wrong, right. how will you be? And that is also inhabiting the self that you would like to be in the face of everything going wrong. Right. Ultimately, negative visualization, I'm, I'm just realizing this now, is still about being able to maintain calm when the shit hits the fan. Right, right. It's one of the things when you talk to almost any, quote, hero, and you say, were you afraid? They say, well, of course I was afraid. It was terrifying. I was, could, could have died, I, you know, and so forth and so on. Um, but a part of me was able to not use that self. A part of me said, there's a fire. Your child is upstairs. The chances are high that you're going to not succeed. And... Now we know that. Now let's get into that fire and get out as fast as we possibly can. Right. Um, so uh, the wonderful thing about heroism is people, uh, in a sense, an hour or two later, come down and realize how frightened. Yeah. How, how, how scary it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, then the shakes start happening. Yeah. And, and I, you know, when I look yeah. at, at, at surfing really serious waves, and when you do it, you also know by name the people who've died from waves not very different from the one that is like 12 seconds away from you. Um, so there's a, a need to, indeed, obviously, and obviously we see it in athletics. I mean, one of the things that's fascinating, if you um, look at a high-injury sport, like, like, most, like, like most contact sports, sure. okay? And one of the things that fascinates me is somebody is playing football and they break their collarbone. Do they leave the game? No, they don't mention it. They're not, maybe not even aware of it for two minutes, 40 minutes, um, because they have set up a self which is not going to pay attention to pain. And uh, there's a long section in the book about Herschel Walker. Yeah. And Herschel Walker, who is, um, he's our, like our role model because he's good at so many different things. He's not only... Um, one of the greatest football players of all time, but he's danced in ballet, okay? And he's run companies and he does other things. And what he said is he learned as a child to have a self that didn't feel pain. And as he moved from being a, a kind of fat, unpopular, small child to being an athlete, he had to overcome um, constant um, overdoing of his body until it hurt. And he just was able to put that aside. So when you're playing uh, NFL football, that's a good trait. To not being able to turn it off is a terrible trait. Okay? So we have these amazing capacities to go into states that are very specific and definitely not for other occasions. Didn't Herschel Walker, I read in your book, have disassociative identity disorder? That's what he thinks, because he didn't have any better term for it. Now, this comes from a moment when he is um, he's buying or se he's buying or selling a car, and there's an argument, and he's he, he's driving to the guy's house, and he has a gun, and part of it is thinking I'm going to kill him over an automobile price, and part of him saying Herschel, this is crazy, you don't want to kill him, and part of him says yes, I do, and at that point Herschel realizes that there's a part of his system which is in serious trouble because most of him knows that killing people is just not a good thing to do. And he goes to therapy. Now, since his therapist doesn't have this, this understanding of selves, 
and is a therapist, when you're a therapist, unless you label someone with a pathology, you can't charge for it. Okay, there are no wellness therapists that you get medical reimbursement for. So he is told that he has a mental illness called disassociation. Hmm. What he has is normal, healthy disassociation and a self that needs psychotherapy. Right. And that self, fortunately, is the one who actually spends time in therapy. And, and Herschel goes on to have you know, a wonderful, healthy, pretty amazing career. He's, he's thinking at the moment of running for governor. Right. Okay? Now, there aren't, um, that suggests a level of health. Right. Okay. Or maybe it maybe suggests, it maybe it suggests <laughs> a level of extreme pathology, but those that that's yeah. a different discussion. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's uh, I'm thinking also about crime right now and the way that we treat crime in America. You inhabited a certain self state in a moment. Therefore, we are going to lock you up for the next 25 years and right. treat you like all of you is that version of yourself. Right. It, with Herschel, it could have just been. It really was just that 51% of him didn't want to do it, yeah. right? And then that's ultimately life because it's these binary decisions that we're making. And if just 51% of, of the better you right. can beat out the worst you, worse you, you're going to be on a good trajectory. Exactly. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we should not um, have punishment for people who carry out crimes and that you should be able to um, just say, well, that was myself, therefore there should be no repercussion, whether it's a crime or an argument in a relationship. So how do you own up to that that version of yourself well, and, no, right. and make sure that you don't inhabit it? Because there's a, a sure is a big difference between thinking about doing something bad and really doing it. <laughs> well, the... It's, it's an interesting problem in law, and my co-author, Jordan Gruber, um, is an attorney. And we really looked at, if only part of you did it, why should all of you go to jail? <laughs> and the answer at the moment is we have no better solution. But the purpose of prison is either punishment, which we know does not improve behavior, um, or rehabilitation, which means how do you clean up your life so that you're not likely to do it again. And there are really two kinds of criminals or people who go to jail. One is it happened once and it was very serious. Or I do that a lot and eventually they stopped me. Okay, um, It's like nobody goes to jail for embezzling one check. <laughs> right. Okay. And the people who are, we're always amused by embezzlers who turn out to be the most trusted person in the company for the past 25 years. Um, and they've been stealing all that time. That's, that's not the same as someone who um, had a very terrible uh, time at home, good or bad reasons, and ends up pushing someone and they fall down the stairs. Okay? Which is, and, they, and they're badly hurt, and the person goes to jail for assault. Um, we don't have a system yet that is built on helping people restore inner harmony. Mm. Uh, we have a system of punishment um, that we know doesn't help anyone, but it meets certain other societal needs, um, which, again, and again, if, how are children raised? Well, there are some children that are raised, which is if you get out of line, I, I give you a slap across the face. There are others who are told, take a time out. See, a time out is, is a wonderful, I just was, there was a recent uh, obituary for the person who, psychologist who made time out an understandable concept. Now, parents already knew about it, but hey, that's psychology. <laughs> they gave him the words. Gave him, gave, it's a great name. But what it is, it's not a time out. It's a time when the selves realize that they need to do a shift. You know, I'm a child and I am lying on the floor and I am screaming and I am saying I hate you forever and I'm, I'm, I'm not breathing very well and I'm turning a little bit blue. And my parents walk out of the room. And I go, wah, wah, scream, scream, nothing, no feedback. Wah, wah, hello, is anybody listening? No. Well, there's no point in my lying here screaming when nobody's listening. And so I get my little act together. 
I, in a sense, have a time out. And during that time out, I shift. You know, you, um, you took your dessert and you shoved it in your sister's face. That's just not okay at the table. Go to your room. Well, what do you do in your room? You don't, like, think about dessert. You don't really think about the situation. You just cool yourself out and a more sensible self happens and it comes downstairs and say, I'm really sorry that I shoved my dessert in her face. Is there any more dessert left? <laughs> because you're a nice kid again. And again, these are all very ordinary things because it's about everyone. It's not about pathology. There is something where the selves are so out of sync with each other that they literally um, can't be reached, and and that's called disassociation, and it's and there is a pathology. There's a, a case in like 1902 of a person who feels this this inner kind of an inner self that's awful, and the person says, "I'm going to my doctor, and I'm going to tell him about that I have this." this difficulty with you. This is an inner dialogue. And the other person says, if you tell the doctor about us, I'm going to hurt you. And the guy goes to the doctor and tells him. And that night, he goes to sleep. And when he wakes up, his back has, has big sla kind of you know fingernail slashes in it that literally the part that said, I'll hurt you, hurt him. Whoa. So this is this is disassociation, right? This is really, and it's pathology, and it needs help. But for most of us, um, most of us having cells simply makes it easier to understand the way the world actually is. Hmm. And we use the example um, in astronomy. There was a long time when the Earth was the center of things, and the sun and the moon and the stars all revolved around us. Now, that's okay until you start measuring. But when people started to be able to measure orbits of planets, it's really hard to make an orbit when, you're, when you have the Earth as the center, okay? And the orbits that they drew were these wild spirals and little curls and twists <coughs> to make it work. And when astronomy kind of realized that the sun was the center of the solar system, there was this cheer across various parts of science because all of a sudden it got really easy to move the science forward because you were looking at reality, not at an assumed incorrect system. And the single self assumption is such an incorrect assumption. Hmm. I've heard that... <laughs> It's never research, it's me-search. <laughs> Have you heard that one? No, I like that. That's a good like one. That. Yeah, well, that's the, the nice thing about when, you, when you're thinking about selves is it's really easy to find someone uh, to share your interest, which <laughs> yeah. is you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so what, how, what was this process like for you, writing this book? I mean, you, the, the amount of research and stories that you uh, and your co-author gathered for this is really amazing um you know going back a ways and finding these kind of obscure stories and kind of, and pulling from different worlds to make this one cohesive book well it's it's not surprising yeah. that a book on selves has two authors yeah. okay? <laughs> now when i started working on this literally over 25 years ago um i was i was figuring out this notion and I was looking for examples like when you get angry with yourself. Right. Um, and when I finally teamed up with Jordan, um, I gave him great file boxes of things with cartoons and little stories and um, all kinds of things. And what Jordan then did was add almost all of the scholarship. There's an amazing amount of scholarship in that book because we're saying if cells are as real as they are, then we should find evidence of them in poetry and literature and music, in psychology, in neuroscience, um, in religious traditions. And we should also find some psychotherapeutic systems that make use of them. Mm -hmm. Now, we did, <laughs> or Jordan mainly did. Uh, and we then would work out what were realistic examples, what made most sense, what would people understand. 
um, because we had to carve away. Uh, it, this isn't, it's kind of encyclopedic at one level, but at the other level, we were getting rid of stuff right and left because we couldn't fit it all in. Because once you start seeing selves, you know, if you think about it, um, if you can remember before you were interested in sexuality, the world had a certain sameness. And when you became pretty sexual, there was an amazing variety of things that caught your attention. Where had they been? Right in front of you. Had you noticed them? No, because your, your, your biology wasn't tuning you up to pay attention. Once it tuned you up, you found it was hard to, you know, it was hard. It was impossible not to look at someone of the sex that interested you and not notice that. Hmm. And so when you begin to, when we started looking at where is there examples of selves, um, it wasn't difficult. Hmm. Uh, I think we've, we had lunch a couple months back and, and you, you brought up that, you know, it doesn't actually feel like I'm an older man and you're a younger man and we're hanging out right. together. It just feels like we're hanging out together. And I feel the same way. You have a level of buoyancy and curiosity that you seem to have cultivated and kept with you. Um, has that been, have you made that a conscious effort? Because it's, it's really often that people will get older and they will become ossified in a right. more closed minded self. Um, and I'll, and I'll say this, you know, I, I recently went on, um, a little trip with, um, a friend of mine who I'm very close to, um, who's an older, older fellow. And, um, uh, he took MDMA and his posture changed. Mm -hmm. His posture changed in a way that I had never actually seen. He opened up, he was, he was, um, moving his arms out to the side and he looked at me and he said, I feel like a little boy again. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, you look like a little boy again. Yeah. Well, two things. One is I love that story because what he was letting go of was restrictions that had arrived unconsciously over the decades. Because there is a little boy in all of us. You know, someone once said it was, someone was worried about writing fiction. What will I find to write about? And the person said, did you have a childhood? <laughs> That's enough material. <laughs> Okay, so we have all those lovely things inside. The question you were asking about us, um, I think what I evolved early on, and I don't know particularly why, was curiosity. I just, I was very aware of not knowing stuff and that people did. And so if you asked a question, even if they didn't know, they would do something. And so um, that curiosity has has maintained. And I think that's a, an attribute, see, that of, of a younger organism. And a younger organism is searching out answers to survive. Okay, I'm reading a lot about plants and fungi, and it's clear they're, they're always looking for opportunities. Okay, now they know it, they know it when, they, when they see it. And so in a sense, um, that was one level of curiosity. The other is, was a, a wonderful mistake I made in understanding education. Um, being, I, I took my PhD during Vietnam, and I was more interested in not being a, in Vietnam than I was in getting a PhD. But they overlapped. And I thought, well, gee, in the educational system, PhD is the top of the heap. Therefore, you should be able to do anything. That was dead wrong, <laughs> okay? Because, again, when I ended up as a counselor, and I saw lots of people getting their PhDs, they were all upset because they began to realize that the way the system was built is that more education usually shrinks the, the size of the world you move in. Right. So someone who says, well, what do you do? Well, I'm an expert on a butterfly that lives in Panama. And I think, whoa, that's a small world. <laughs> Okay. Now, they may have a full life and they have lots of other interests, but <coughs> professionally, their world shrank. Right. Uh, professionally, if you're a psychologist, you, 
you're not trained to do to learn much about, if anything, about the body, which all of your clients have. <laughs> okay, so that 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 my curiosity, the kind of I thought, well, if I'm on the top of the heap, I get to you know go anywhere and learn anything, and it it makes the world obviously uh, more uncertain. Yep. And you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. Right. And um, I taught in design engineering. And, it, and at one point, I realized I was teaching the introductory class to all of the, the, the graduate students in design. And they fell into two groups, the ones who were going to love design and the ones who were going to always be anxious. And I didn't quite know why for a while, but then I realized the ones who love design were very happy with uncertainty. Because when you're inventing something, you are in a state in which that didn't exist yet, so the solution didn't happen. And you have a high failure rate. If you can't handle a high failure rate, you can't be a designer. If you want to be, in many, many areas, an engineer, you are improving things. You are simplifying things. You are miniaturizing things. You are extending the range of things. None of those have the same level of anxiety. Hmm. And so the other thing that made uncertainty for me comfortable and curiosity were, were early work with psychedelics. My own early psychedelic experiences said nothing is, nothing is fixed, nothing is certain, and everything is related. So it's okay to go in any direction because you're, you're part of the same system. Hmm. You know, it's like, it's like, well, I don't really like the earth. I'm going to jump off. Okay, and you, as long and the higher you jump, the more you realize this isn't working. Hmm. Uh, while if you say, "Well, I'm on Earth and it's got a lot of issues, I better find out how to at least solve them around myself." Uh, it's a different world. So um, it is also an interesting thing to ask people, older people uh, and younger people, how old they are inside. Hmm. Very few people feel they are their exact physical age. And that's something that, that um, I can feel myself starting to explore it right now, thinking, gee, that would make an interesting thing to restart researching, and, and I have to watch out. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, my friend who, who I, uh, took the MDMA said, I've never felt my own age. Yeah. I've ne he said, I've, I've felt a, about 40 for the last 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I got into this because I took my father at age 85 to visit my uncle who was 91. And I was kind of wondering about them. Um, and at dinner, I said, how old are each of you? And that was a moment of reflection. These were both pretty introspective guys. And my uncle said, I'm seven. And I said, seven? <laughs> I said, where did that come from? He said, that's when I was learning the most kind of learning at the most rapid speed. And what I think he was saying is his personality was starting to, to solidify into something he could recognize. And my father said, well, I'm maybe 21, 22. Now, in his life, he had lived in New York City, and he had an opportunity that made very little sense in terms of our lives to spend up to a year in Paris, which he did. And that's the year that he identifies himself with, because that was the year in, in which he was learning the most. Yeah. And he was the most open because this was, when you're in a foreign country, everything has to be paid attention to. You know, and when you're in England, one of the things you learn early on is you actually have to look both ways before you cross the street, which you haven't had to do since you were about eight, um, and so forth. So that it is an interesting question that, and, and I will make it very clear the book does not cover this i love it no okay? this, is, uh, this, this but makes I can for a good see, podcast I, but i can just see a wonderful uh, you know question starting out is how old are you inside just give us a, you know give us your external age and your internal age and comment um i think we've got something what's your answer well i'm somewhere in my 20s um probably because that was um the early psychedelic era was uh, just opening in every direction uh, and being careful to stay in graduate school in spite of seeing through graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, so in, and, and at that point in my life, the, 
everything was a possibility. Uh, because one of the things that you learn is consciousness is not limited to your physical form. And if consciousness extends beyond your physical form, where does it end? And Alan Watts used to have a wonderful comment is your consciousness doesn't end at your fingertips. So if you could explore with consciousness in any direction, then you could look at anything. So um, I was telling someone this morning about um, if they're going to go into the redwoods, uh, and they were intending to have a, a high-dose psychedelic experience. I said, I remember a friend who did that. And you come back and you think, God, he's going to talk about holding the trees and being feeling as if he's this giant thousand-year-old tree and with the birds. And I said, how was he? He said, it was really hard. I said, what was hard? He said, you know, I was holding on to this tree, and I realized that the tree was like holding on like crazy to not fall over. <laughs> <laughs> I had to prop it up for six hours. <laughs> and, and, and as he went on to it, you know, that was the feeling of tension that he got from this tree. And then if you actually look at redwoods versus other trees, redwoods are absolutely straight up. Now, you say, why are they straight up? I mean, a lot of, you know, oaks go in every direction and trees lean and do fine. Well, when you see a fallen redwood, it's a very small root ball. It is not balanced on this huge, you know, understory of great big, you know, five foot thick roots. It's not at all. So it isn't, <laughs> right? It isn't stabilized by its roots. So that's why it has to be straight up. Yeah. And, I, and, and that kind of curiosity and that kind of fun um, keeps you young. Yeah. Um, I remember a moment when you were on Sam Harris's podcast and you were bringing up the, these self states and the idea that when you're in a state, sort of by default, you forget that other states are even possible, Yeah, which is why it's so hard to talk to someone when they're depressed or when they're angry is that they feel like that's the only way to be. Right. And, um, I think about that in regards to people losing curiosity as they get older. Um, I think it's, it's a real, I'm noticing this at 31 <laughs> getting into more professional life right. and just seeing how, uh, priorities change. Um, you, I'm starting to think about like, the, the path forward, um, thinking mm -hmm. about my future a bit more. Um, and I, I work in a really great culture that, um, very much incentivizes creativity and weirdness. And I'm actually, I notice, um, my friend Shane Heath, who's the founder, I've, I've noticed how much he really drills that into everyone who, who works at Mudwater is like, be your authentic self, be creative. Because if you don't, I think it's very easy to conform to a, a less original version of yourself. And then you forget that the younger, more curious, more funny version even existed right. until you are way older and maybe you have a high dose psychedelic trip and you realize, wow, I really liked that part of myself <laughs> that I lost. Right. Yeah. It's, it's almost feels like a, a kind of mental illness that we will find these versions of ourselves or these things that we, that we do that make us inhabit this version of ourself that we really love. Well, and then we forget about it. Well, we don't, I'm not sure we forget. It's more like, um, you put it in a, in a box in the closet. Right. Um, and one of the things, there's an exercise which I've never quite understood, which says, wouldn't you like to write a letter, either depending on who you are, to your younger self yes. with advice or to your older self with, with, with warnings? Um, and I don't, I don't find that very useful. But I do find useful is having a personal journal of who you are right now and putting it in a box. And um, I just have run across... Uh, a journal I kept for uh, six or eight months when I was living in Paris, writing a very bad novel and living as as uh, bohemian a life as I could handle. 
And I look at this person, and I'm reading about him, and I have such good feelings about him. You know, you, you have a kindness to your to your younger self, yeah, because they're because of all of its positive values, and you also see its shallowness and its kind of dishonesty, which he admits in his journal. Um, so, and I'm also just realizing that my brother, who's who's writing some some writing up some of his years in Africa. Um, has some letters that he wrote from Africa to his father, like 50 years ago. And again, he's rediscovering who he was. So the, that it is easy to forget who you were. So it is useful to leave a few cues. Right. Um, photographs are good. Um, letters to people are wonderful. And private comments to yourself are, again, wonderful because... Um, you also can see the selves that were operating then. Right. Okay, so I'm, I'm busy writing about a relationship uh, that I'm having in Paris with someone I have a wonderful time with, but I privately say, but I don't really love her, and I don't want the relationship to get out of hand, but I don't want to lose her. And there's this kind of crumminess to it and a kind of honesty, <laughs> um, which I wouldn't have... which I wouldn't have recalled. Right. Uh, but it adds a level of understanding to oneself to be able to look at one's past. Um, not, a big, not a big revelation to say that your past is interesting, at least to you. I mean, one of the reasons that people write memoirs is first and foremost to be able to talk about themselves day and night. And second of all, it might have a commercial value. Um, fortunately, you win in terms of learning about yourself. No matter what. One thing that I find um, terrifying about <laughs> social media is the immediacy with which you receive feedback on something that you say mm. and how quickly if you let's say you say your humor is a great example of this, right? Like you say something that you think is funny on social media, you get this this panoply of vitriol coming at you right. and then you realize, Ooh, better not be that kind of person anymore. And it narrows the scope of selves very quickly. And what results is this group think where everyone in the world is saying the exact same as everyone else, because that's what's comfortable well, to say. Now I want to ha ask you this question, although you know, for a long time you didn't have maybe that immediacy of feedback right. that social media provides, you have maintained humor and curiosity throughout your life. And I would imagine that you have run up against people or groups of people who thought, oh, Jim, don't do that. Oh, and yeah. it would have been really easy for you to say, oh, better not do that. So my question is, what has allowed you mm -hmm. to maintain that version of yourself throughout your entire life? Oh, boy, these are tough questions. <laughs> well, says he, fumbling in his head for something that's going to sound a sufficiently smart ass so he can continue to do it. Uh, two things. One is there are two kinds of humor. And I've, I've looked at a lot of people talking and one is telling jokes, which is kind of breaking the, the, what you're talking about uh, and adding a level of humor. The other is seeing things in a way that you find bizarre enough to describe and that you find more amusing than terrifying. Okay? For instance, and I'm not going to tell a joke about it, but octopuses have brains in the end of their tentacles. Okay, And I look at that, and I can't help smiling. Okay, Because what I'm aware of is nature said, I wonder what would happen if we just put a lot of brains in something <laughs> instead of just one. <laughs> and the octopuses were created, and, and um, they can do all kinds of fascinating things, and they're interesting people. They're, they're not very nice to each other, it turns out. If you give them MDMA, they like each other more. <laughs> I mean, we're be just beginning to get it. But... It's hard, it's, it's easy to, 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 to be light about octopuses. And that, and that I extend that to me and to human beings. Um, I mean, one of the things, we just talked about memoir, okay? Now, it's kind of bizarre that someone takes a couple of years 
to basically write about themselves, knowing that they couldn't say that to people. Everybody walk away. And feeling that this is going to be an you know value, mm. okay? And because we are storytelling beings, we don't like facts. We love stories. Yeah. Uh, when you read a story of someone's life, somehow it enriches yours, okay? It's worth considering how because what it says is there's another solution to life than the one you've got. You know, I, I keep thinking there's a section in Angela's Ashes, which is the a memoir of a poor Irish kid growing up in a poor Irish family, very stereotypical, which is the father is a drunk and everybody is poor. And it's very moving. And there are parts that are just hilarious because he has a, the writer, many years later into his life, has a point of view where he can see the nuttiness in his situation. And there's a moment when he's stolen something, like two cents. And he's told by the priest that that's a sin. And that's a serious sin of, of stealing. And that, that, at the, that in the afterlife, he will be punished. He will be, and he is told that he couldn't go to hell for this. Now, one way to take that is with a great deal of depression, okay? Because here is this authority figure, you're a child, and you're told here is the result of your act, and you won't know until after you die, but you're going to be tortured forever. That could, you know, as we say, that could ruin your whole day. Right. What he then gets, he says, wow, I'm condemned to go to hell. I've... That's it. Therefore, I have just been relieved of any moral limitations. <laughs> I can do anything. I can be bad. I can steal. I can cheat. I can beat up people. I can be a criminal because I've already, you know, I'm, I'm already, I've already lost the game. Therefore, I am freer than anybody I've ever met. Right. And I looked at that and I thought, that's, that's the beauty of memoir. Because to come up with that, that's sh like shifted my head, okay? Um, and I love things that shift my head. And that reading about how other people solve usually terrible problems. It's very hard to write a memoir if you've had a, a perfectly nice life. Yeah. Okay, it's, that's rough. <laughs> yeah, the worse the trip, the better the story. <laughs> yeah, uh, except if you're really, really good. Now, Marcel Proust, who grew up wealthy and and educated in a wealthy and educated culture, um, managed to write one of the great literary you know, creations that most of us have never read. But basically he said, you know, I'm just thinking about stuff and remembering it, and I'm going to fictionalize it a little bit because a lot of them are living, um, and that's what I'm going to do for 20 or 30 years. Um, and he enjoyed it. So one of the things about... Uh, finding different lifestyles is how many ways are there to enjoy a life? Now, media does have that self, there is a self-censoring, okay? Uh, for instance, someone says to me on a program like this, you know, uh, will you discuss your own use of psychedelics, okay? And I think there's no advantage in anything I say because that isn't, that's just gossip, so I say, I, that's really not very interesting. Let me tell you about the 1,500 people whose reports I have about this use of psychedelics. So I've made a justification to not discuss something personal. Now, my justification in my mind is splendid. But I could also say, anything I say is people are going to be mad at me. I mean, if I say right now, I'm going to tell you a joke about an American Indian. Now, I know that if I actually did that, there would be, no matter how good the joke was, there would be people who'd say, you just insulted whoever it is you told the joke about. Now, if I say, but well, it isn't actually an American Indian, it's a, a Russian peasant. Well, there are f fewer Russian peasants in the media environment to be upset, but there'd be a few. Who say, you know, joking about Russian peasants who've been oppressed for centuries, blah, 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 blah. So the social media, um, in a sense, you, you need to say, what is important in the question? What is important in the answer? Is there any point? Meaning, um, 
you know, if, if I wanted to tell you uh, a story about the odor of my feet, it's hard to, you know, I wouldn't get a lot of negative feedback, but I wouldn't get a lot of listeners either because it's not of any real interest or value to anyone. Hmm. And so part of the social media question is what am I doing? Because what I want from my listeners and my viewers is that they get something. And the word benefit, I'm being general, meaning they're entertained, they're frightened, they're disgusted, they're made action, but something happens. Because you don't go to media um, to have nothing happen in your mind. Right. You know, one of the things I love about films um, in a large theater especially, is I'm sitting there and I'm frightened of, for, because someone is about to be hurt, killed, etc. Or I'm really excited someone is about to fall in love, become a king. And I'm thinking, there are people who have just spent three years and $60 million so I can have this feeling. That's really cool. That's, that's an amazing uh, kind of leverage you know i spent eight and a half dollars for a ticket they spent 60 million <laughs> to make my eight and a half dollars valuable yeah um so the positive side of media is it's designed to do something for you right and when people say well i don't want you to have said that um their introspection would be helpful yeah. Okay. One of the things I've learned, if I'm ready to write a hate letter because something I've heard or said, is I have to wait a day and find out what's really going on. That And will my letter matter? Or am I just doing that to hear myself? And a lot fewer letters get written if you take that little 24-hour shift because also, as going back, uh, different selves read it. I mean, one of the things I know when I'm writing something is at the end of the day, I finished a draft, and I think, that was pretty good. I'm really pleased. In the morning, I read it, and I think, who wrote this? <laughs> yeah. This is terrible. <laughs> Done that once or and, twice. Yeah, and, and I know now enough so that I'm very careful. After I've finished a draft and I feel good, I like to go to bed feeling good. I know in the morning. I know by absolutely that in the morning it will need a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what the work will be or I would have done it. So the self that, that enjoyed the writing and thinks, oh, that was really clever, goes to bed and the one that wakes up and says, you know, this is your fourth draft and it looks like you've got four or five drafts to go. Let's... And there's a part of me that says, oh, I've got to do the work. And, that's a, and I have to get into the self that's willing to do the corrections. So it's clear as a writer, there's at least two very different selves. And um, unless they're both working on it, the writing isn't very good. I love how much you keep yourself uncertain. That's what you were just talking about, yeah. right? You can be so certain that you had this great this great draft, but you maintain that level of distance. It's like, um, you know, you're, you're holding the sand in your hand, but you're not gripping it <laughs> right. because you know, it'll fall right through. Uh, and I think that, that, that there is a, a real wisdom to keeping yourself, keeping your perspective tilted in that way, because going back to that, that question of like, how do you maintain your, funkiness throughout life mm -hmm. and not become unoriginal in the face of maybe some real anger coming at you is to step back, as you said, and look at it through a different prism. You're going to go to hell. Oh, wow. How freeing, <laughs> right? right? That right. any situation can be funny if you look at it through a different lens. Well, funny, see what funny really means is there's a you're seeing it in a way that's not usual. Right. You know, literally the historical funny of, quote, slipping on a banana peel. Now, that's not really funny. Someone's hurt. However, it's an unusual way of getting hurt. And at the moment before they are hurt, um, they're in a very bizarre situation. And we, we laugh and then we we're, we're kind of regret our laughter very often because it's, quote, at the expense of someone else. But it turns out if you are laughing at yourself, because we are all 
um, see, I wouldn't choose the word uncertain. We're all um, we're we're all equally ignorant of the future, but a lot of us are pretty ignorant of the present. <laughs> <laughs> and when we do something, there is a you you say, well, wow, that's really bizarre what I just did. And you have a, and either you are ashamed, how could I have done this? You're guilty. Um, or you say, wow, that was fascinating. I wonder why that was so. I mean, one of the wonderful things about the book Sex at Dawn, which you mentioned, which is a pivotal book in my life, because it, it said most of what you've been taught was made up by people with very, very high agendas. And that the actuality of human sexuality is a lot more diffuse, a lot more interesting, and a lot more um, pleasurable than you were taught. And I thought, oh, well, that certainly solves a lot of very puzzling moments in my life. Um, and then I would say something to people, and they would tell me that how wrong I was. And I'd say, could you perhaps read this book? <laughs> and in a sense, when you write a book that, that opens up a reality, it's, you want to share it. And the nice thing we've had with selves is people are telling each other, you know, this book... After this book, I felt better. And it's not a self-help book, okay? I worked very, very hard not to have it a self-help book. And the back few chapters are kind of self-help. It's a self-help book. <laughs> <laughs> but what it is, because I've written a self-help book, and it was, you know, terrific. Um, but like every other self-help book, at the end of it, you have to do stuff. Do affirmations, do weight control, change your gym habits, change your driving, change your relationships, be nicer to your, you know, there's stuff to do. And what happens when people read your symphony of selves, it's an awareness shift. It's, oh, that's the way it is. It's like when you read a nature book. Uh, I'm just reading now uh, a wonderful book that's talking about how trees help each other. And it's a wonderful study where there were fir trees and birch trees. And it turned out that when birch trees didn't have any leaves, the fir trees were sending them through an underground network nutrients they needed. When the birch trees were full of leaves and the fir trees were getting shaded, the birch trees were sending nutrients to the fir trees. Okay? Now that shifts the way I look at the forest. I will never be able to look at trees as individuals anymore. Because I know if I kind of strip away, you know, if I could look down below, they're not only hanging out with each other, <coughs> but they're helping other species. And then I think, how about humans? And we don't seem to work as nicely as trees. So I'm beginning to shift my allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm beginning to see that species, the strongest don't survive, but the most cooperative survive. And it may be that's a hint of why human beings are working kind of overtime to eliminate themselves from the planet. Because if you look at us as humans as a species and you say, what species benefit from humans? Um, it's, an it's a very interesting question. Okay, so far I, have, I don't have anything on the list yet. <laughs> say Probably marijuana. Right. Because marijuana has had more people helping it <laughs> and giving it new species and, and proliferating it maybe than anything else. But the list gets very small. Right. Um, yeah, there's a, a comedian that I love named Neil Brennan where he, he has this joke about like if marijuana was a person and cocaine was a person and heroin was a person, they'd be like, man, marijuana, when I was a kid, he was living under a bridge. <laughs> he was not doing well. Now look at marijuana. Man, he's in stores. He's got all this money. Like, damn, like cocaine and heroin. We're still under a bridge. We got to get legalized too. Do you, do you, um, you know, when I mentioned, uh, my friend, the MDMA and how it changed yeah. his body language. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about, the, how our physicality is in relation to our self states, because in your book, you, you, although it's not a self-help book, you do have sections about the power of something like breath work right. or meditation. And I've found that it is 
nearly impossible to get myself out of a bad mood just by thinking about it. Right. It's actually necessary for me to shock my system in one way or another for me to toggle into a new self state. Yep. Um, and I loved what you said at, at the beginning of this podcast about how you can really, by acknowledging that you have different versions of yourself, you can prepare to be in the correct state at the correct time, right? right? So, oh, I have a big meeting tomorrow. Maybe I won't drink tonight right. because I hypothesize that I will be less articulate, in a worse mood, less able to handle stress. So I wanted to ask you more specifically about the body and, and, you, and maybe your own relationship with this as well and that we're, we are not just... Um, minds, you know, being <laughs> held by bodies. Right. We're, we're actually, <clears throat> um, if you actually look at a university campus, one way you can often tell who the professors are is their heads are slightly ahead of their bodies. Hmm. And it's as if their bodies are always kind of running under them to keep them from falling over. Um, and I, I remember being told this by a massage therapist once at Esalen, that she could see who the academics were, you know, when they took their clothes off already, because their posture had this, this slight uh, forward thrust as if their head was more important. That okay. is funny. So the question, you know, the, the, the notion that you control your body, whoever you are, um, is becoming nonsense. Um, it looks more often... Uh, that the what's called the biome. The biome is the, the viruses and bacteria who have decided that you're a useful place to be. Now, and I think we're beginning to know this, but not only are there thousands of species inside of each of us, but uh, cell by cell, there's more of them than there is of us. Okay, so we are more viruses and bacteria by, by number than we are human cells. Human cells are bigger, so we're a little heavier. Okay? It turns out that a lot of those bacteria and viruses in their endless discussion of who's on top uh, affect human thought. Okay? So it may be that there's a certain amount of what we call thinking, which is bacteria-pushed or virus pushed. And we also know that when we're physically aware of being ill, our emotions change. Okay? We also know that we can hallucinate with a fever. Now, what is it that in, in warming up the cells of the brain that uh, hallucinations appear? And I recall a, a high fever I had, I think it was still in graduate school, and it was very nice because one day I had really a number of friends who came over and talked with me while I was recovering. Except that wasn't true at all. None of them were true. None of them existed. And as I began to realize that I had totally accepted the reality of these imaginary people and had conversations with them, the question is, what is the relationship of body to mind? And the answer is a lot more body than we, than we mind. Right. <laughs> than we are reminded. Oh, I like okay? that. It's a lot more body than we mind. And, and, and uh, as one of the things I've had in the last couple of years, and I've said to people, um, I'm not as smart in the mornings. And I've simply seen that instead of, you know, leaping out of bed and it's another wonderful day and I'm still alive uh, and Trump isn't president, you know, there are things working, okay? Um, and the morning, I think, why did I agree to do a podcast with Kyle today? Okay? I'm very fond of Kyle, but Jesus, am I not up for it? And then I think, but... I set it up at early afternoon, and by early afternoon, my body will have shifted, my IQ will have gone back up, and I will enjoy it. And even more um, right mind in the right time, I will have made a shift into a self that works well with media. And one of the things I've said when people have, have tried filming me for, for documentaries is I'm a good person for a documentary because I speak in sentences. 
And therefore, editing me is a lot easier because my wife, Dorothy, is a filmmaker and I know a lot about what you can do um, with people's interviews. <laughs> so I've, I'm aware of the self that, in a sense, can even overrule sometimes the body. And I had a, a very vivid realization of this. I was quite ill, intestinal, fatigue, um, grumpy, awful. And uh, this was like the last trip I took before lockdown. And I, I went to Utah, which is about an hour and a half flight. And I was met and I was taken care of. And it couldn't have been nicer. And I felt terrible. And I managed to get in like a 10-minute nap before the evening event. And I'm sitting in, in the, the little preparation room, the green room. And there's about 500 people out there. And it's opening up psychedelics to Salt Lake City, which has um, had a reputation for not being open. <coughs> and I'm just physically terrible. And I'm thinking, I wonder what happens if I faint in the middle of the talk. I mean, that's where I was. And I thought, well, you know... <laughs> I can't run away. They, they came to see me. Let's, we're going to have to go through with this. And so I walk out on stage, and I've asked for a chair, not a podium. And I sit down, and there's 500 people. And it's clear they are glad to be there. And I say something, um, not about myself or my condition, but something about them, and they like that. And so there's a goodwill already being built and there's an energy that you get from an, from an audience it's a very palpable and i i've actually prepared this talk which is somewhat rare um and it's and i give it and it's it's really good um i'm laughing they're laughing it's profound there are moments of great kind of awareness that we're all in this together um this is an exciting moment for these people in utah to see each other it's really wonderful. And after it's over, I'm cheerful and chatty and smart. Um, people are asking questions right and left. I'm walking around the stage and leaning way over to people. Um, and that lasts for about an hour and a half. And then I feel terrible and go to bed. Hmm. What I watched in that was the shift into the, the kind of onstage personality who was in a remarkably good health. And it's, I've now been seeing that over the, the time of, of COVID, um, where that shift will occur because I have somehow figured out how to get into that self at the right time. Hmm. And so the body is very real. And there are times when we put the body aside. And we know of that. We, we all know the image of the, the, the little housewife who looks out the window and there's a there's a, a car rolling slowly and it's about to, to roll over her child. And she runs out and she stops the car and she picks up the back of the car and pulls her child out. Now, it occurs. It's real. And then what happens is a tabloid appears and said, could you do that again so we could get a picture of <laughs> yeah. it? And the, the woman says, you're crazy. I'm a, I weigh 152 pounds. I can't do that. <laughs> because we're able to make use of the entire body at its highest level of uh, capacity when the situation demands it. Mm. And it's, again, what professional athletes know, is they get into the zone and they're able to stay there, including, as we've talked about, when they're seriously injured. Fine, I'm seriously injured. I'm not stopping. I, you know, I can make another 10 yards before I get tackled. <laughs> yeah, there's a great uh, moment in this Netflix series called The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. Yeah. Where he eats this pizza the night before a big game and gets food poisoning. Right. And he's vomiting on the bench before the game. And then he goes out and absolutely dominates. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Right. So the body is really important especially in the long run. And uh, as you get older, you like long runs. Um, but in the moment, the selves, selves can dominate. Yeah, So, But not for too long. Um, that Utah example I mentioned, as, as I, I could kind of feel my adrenaline saying we are, we're used up. And the truth is you're not that well right. <laughs> in general. Um, and, then I had, I, and, and then I said to myself... 
I have another talk tomorrow morning. <laughs> Gotta run. What will happen? Yeah. Because <laughs> that's morning, which was like two strikes. Yeah. Um, well, as a, as a theme in this conversation around maintaining uncertainty, yeah. um, what's something that you have changed your mind about? Whoa. What I haven't, what haven't I changed my mind about? What's a, what's a big one? Well, um, I would say that there was a whole period of my life when, <clears throat> even though I grew up in California, I was really oblivious to the natural world. I was uh, living in my head. Um, uh, at college, um, someone said of me, does he ever have a serious thought? Okay. So I had cultivated kind of uh, smart-ass shallow. And I had very little relationship to the physical world. I was not involved in any sports. And I, um, I, was, not a, um, I was not physical or popular in that sense. Um, and I began to realize as life went on that all of that was just um, kind of like going to a restaurant and ordering only one dish forever when there was a whole menu and that the world was much bigger and living outside the United States was a good help because it opened, you, you, you have to be more open just to function. And when you change countries every few days and change languages every few days, you, you develop an, a, you have to develop a tolerance for uncertainty. And I love the notion that we're talking about certainty and uncertainty because um, realistically, the world is not certain. And we make it certain so that we feel comfortable, not because it is certain. And so the, you know, the, 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 the kind of classic notion is the only thing you can depend on is change. And that becomes actually something worth noticing rather than just a cliche um, because it is the changes that get your attention. And as literally as kind of predator animals, if you're looking at a natural scene and there's a flicker in one hundredth of the scene, your eye will go to that flicker where the bird moved in and out or something. Because we're trained from, or evolution has given us, that if it moves, pay attention. <laughs> if it doesn't move, you have a little more time. And that shift um, makes liking the natural world more and more wonderful. And one of the wonderful things about uh, the COVID year is there are several walks we're in Santa Cruz that I take in Santa Cruz. And I know so much about every flower in every yard because it was part of my walk. And to not make it repetitive, I would see the changes. And when you see changes, your life is more interesting. When you don't see changes, your life is safer, but in the long run, your life isn't safe anyway. Yeah, because we're all going to die, and, na yeah, and yeah. nature can uh, provide that sense of, of awe. I think that nature, in a lot of ways, is the opposite of certainty, Yeah, uh, and that's a good one. Na nature is a, a really good way to maintain flexibility well, in life. Because nature, I mean, I, I'm living near the ocean, okay? And every once in a while, I look at the waves and I think that wave says, I'm really an interesting person. You know, I've had an interesting <laughs> childhood and I've been growing <laughs> and I've got friends yeah. and, and I'm just really an interesting I, person. I've been okay? for a long time. I've never <laughs> thought of that. And then the wave hits the beach and it says, God, that was fantastic. <laughs> Whoa, that was better than sex, whatever sex could have been. And then the wave is somehow drawn back and then the wave's gone. And the ocean says, I see it all the time. These waves have this funny notion that they are somehow separated. Uh, and they, in a funny way, they are for moments. But I then say, well, let's see, how am I different from a wave? Well, I haven't come up with much except that, that I have a lower percentage of water, which I'm only about 70% water and the wave is more. <coughs> and I last longer than a wave, but redwoods last much longer than I do and rocks last way much longer than I do. So that isn't much of, a, that, that, it doesn't give you much. So 
the the awareness of uncertainty is also the awareness that there is an endless variety of possible experiences that are available. That is so good, man. Thank you so much, Jim. <laughs> I, uh, I've, I think I've had you on this podcast first, maybe five years ago mm-hmm. and we're up to on, on my podcast feed right now, I think to episode 280 or so. And I, wow. I had you on on number 19 and it was the <laughs> first time that I had, uh, talked about psychedelics publicly Mm -hmm. and this is even five years ago it feels like it was a little bit more risque than it was today and um and it was oh i'm having dr jim fadiman on my (laughs) podcast right now (laughs) here we go and um and we had the show and it was really fun and i used your name to get so many other podcast guests over the years (laughs) How, how cool and that just continued to open doors for me and continued to open new conversations and expand my mind. Um, so I want you to know that you, you really have had a big effect on me knowingly or unknowingly. And I wanted to say thank you very much. Well, although I, I could be contemporary and say no problem. Um, thank you. <laughs>